Welcome back everybody to Beyond the Patterns. So today I really have an exciting guest for you and another presentation here. Our guest speaker today will be Adrian Dalka. So he is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He obtained his PhD from CCL MIT and his research focuses on probabilistic models and machine learning techniques to capture relationships between medical images, clinical diagnosis and other complex medical data. His work spans medical image analysis, computer vision, machine learning and computational biology. He received his bachelor's and master's in computer science from the University of Toronto. So today I have the great pleasure to announce his presentation entitled Unsupervised Learning of Medical Image Correspondencies in Medical Image Analysis. Adrian, I'm very, very happy to have you here as a guest and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro. Um, thank you for having me here uh, virtually. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about sort of uh, image registration and a lot of our recent work in machine learning for it. I'm going to focus on uh, brain MRIs throughout the talk, but really anything I say uh, applies more broadly. It's just that we have a lot of brain MRI data that we're really interested in. Uh, and to anyone who's here live, please do feel free to interrupt. Uh, it makes it a bit easier to know there's people on the other side. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story of how I got into image registration and bring everyone on the same page for the first 15 to 20 minutes. And then I'll talk about uh, sort of the most recent work that we're uh, tackling. So. Back in my PhD, which is not that long ago, I uh, worked very closely to with uh, stroke uh, neurologist collaborators who had all these interesting uh, data and problems that came from stroke patients. And we had all kinds of interesting models we wanted to play with. We wanted to segment strokes, segment various diseases, uh, predict how a disease is going to change, analyze various progressions of the disease in the brain, um, even sort of predict how a brain itself is going to change with the disease. So if I have a brain and I have the genetics of a person, maybe some clinical variables, how are all these going to affect the brain in the future? Can we predict how it's all going to shape up later on? So we had all these models in our head, some of them we managed to do, but um, there was this one fundamental process that we kept hitting against, which was this image alignment or image registration. And the problem at the time was that there was an awful lot of research into it and it was fundamental to everything we did, but it was quite slow. And so we had to work with thousands of images and we didn't just want to align these images once, but we wanted to build models that involved aligning the images over and over and over, either to compare the images one to another, to put them all in a common reference frame, to predict how they're going to spatially change, all this sort of stuff required registration. Um, the top algorithm at the time, once we kind of modified it to work with these images, required a lot of uh, CPU runtime, maybe a couple hours per image. And we had to deal with thousands of images and we wanted to get more and more sophisticated models. So it was incredibly difficult to do the research we wanted to do. It wasn't just about processing the images once. And so, uh, the algorithms I'm going to talk about today involve machine learning, and once they're trained, they're substantially faster. Uh, there may be a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds, 
on a CPU or, um, sorry, or, or one second or less on a GPU. So they're substantially faster. But what's important about that is that it enables us to now try out models for other things that involve registration that um, was, it was really difficult to try out before. And so in some ways, we're happy we can facilitate faster registration, but most importantly for us is we can try fancier and fancier models. So let me dive into it. Um, when I talk about registration, I mean the following problem. We get two images and the goal is to find correspondences between them. And specifically, we look for a deformation field. So it's kind of uh, like having a vector at every location that tells us how to move one image into the other. Uh, so that's the sort of, that's the overarching goal. And this problem is really fundamental in image analysis. Um, when we want to analyze populations, we often want to register a lot of scans to a common template or atlas so that we can do the analysis in the same space. Uh, we also want to compare two subjects directly. We all also want to compare a scan before and after a surgery or before and after um, a, a particular amount of time to see how anatomy has changed or how a tumor has changed, how a lesion has changed. Um, we also want to use registration to propagate information from one scan to another, like segmentations. It's also very, very related to other fields. So there's optical flow in computer vision. Um, there's a lot of uh, alignment in 1D signals. There's even in computational biology where I, I got my start in research, you align sequences, for example, which is kind of what I did 15 years ago. So because it's so fundamental and so broad, there's been an awful lot of really good research in this. And the main sort of dominant way to solve this problem is through pairwise kind of iterative optimization. And this is still how it's done today in most packages. Uh, and the idea is you get these two images and you wiggle them in some smart way until they align. And mathematically, the way we do this is we have an optimization problem. It kind of looks something like this for almost any registration you do. There's essentially two terms. You want a deformation field that does two things. One thing is it aligns one image to the other. So it makes them look uh, similar in some sense of similarity. And then the other thing is this deformation field should be regular in some sense. It could be so that it preserves anatomy. It could be so that it never crosses in any way. Uh, there's different ways to define that. And the research has predominantly been on parts of this problem. How do we find the best image similarity term for a task? Best regularization term? Uh, how do we build probabilities around these things? How do we optimize this thing faster or more robust? But this iterative approach is fundamentally slow because every time you get two new images, you pretend you've never seen data before and you kind of start the whole process from scratch. And this is about um, maybe about three, four years ago when learning based methods uh, came into registration and they kind of came from machine learning. They came from a completely different uh, mentality, I would say. And the idea was we, were, we are going to treat this as a regression problem. We're going to try to find a mechanism, a, a neural network, that takes in two images and just gives you the deformation field. And if we can do that, if we can find a box that does that, it will be faster because we don't have to pretend we've never seen data before. So that's kind of the idea. But the very first methods that came about um, said, well, this is easy. We just treat this as a, as a supervised problem. We get a bunch of ground truth deformation fields and we learn a neural network. And this turns out to be challenging because you need to get the ground truth deformation fields. And that's not easy. You could get them from a classical method. You could get them from uh, simulating them but it's sort of a separate step that you have to run and it has its own downfalls and it requires a lot of time. 
So um, this is about the time we, we were kind of coming on the scene and we got really excited about the possibility of uh, doing this in an unsupervised fashion. And I'm going to describe how we do that in our framework called Voxelmorph. And there's other um, uh, researchers that around the same time thought about the same stuff. And what we were really excited about is bringing in classical concepts from classical modeling into the learning framework, because we realized that would allow us to learn everything in an unsupervised way where we only need the data itself. So uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to describe how we do that. Uh, it's very straightforward, but it sort of sets the foundation for everything else. And then in the last, in the sort of rest of the talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to uh, discuss different projects that build off of this and different properties of these sort of frameworks. Uh, so maybe I'll take a quick pause there. And are there any questions so far on the setup? I think it was very clear. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's let's uh, start. So, all right, so the framework is very simple. I think everybody probably knows what a unit is or some architecture that goes from some large dimensional thing to a large dimensional thing. And the idea is you get these two images, you feed it through your favorite architecture, and you get out this high dimensional deformation field. And so how, so the, the, the key idea in training this is how do we tell the network whether the deformation field is any good? And if you have ground truth deformation, that's easy. You set up some sort of like mean square error between the ground truth and, and the deformation field that the network gives you. Now it turns out there's a bunch of subtleties there and these networks don't work quite that well because in certain regions you can't quite predict the right thing because you don't have enough information. There's all kinds of uh, sort of subtleties with that, but the main idea kind of works. However, what do we do if we don't have deformations uh, ground, as ground truth? Well, we know one way to tell whether the deformation field is any good or not, which is to look at the classical loss functions, right? And so depending on the task, depending on the images, you can bring in variations of this loss function where you said, well, whatever deformation field the network gives me, it should match up the image as well, and it should be smooth. So we can use this as a loss function. Now, of course, we don't really care about optimizing one deformation field. We care about uh, optimizing the network. So in this case, we're going to have a loss that sums over all of the image pairs in our data. And we're not going to have the deformation field itself in the loss. We're going to have the network, right? So the parameters of the network are what we're optimizing. But this is all fairly standard. And once you've kind of trained networks, you get this. And um, you know now what's going to happen is the network is going to take in two images, it's going to do something, it's going to give us a deformation field, and the loss is going to say, oh, this isn't quite smooth enough, or it doesn't quite match up images well enough. And that's going to back propagate through the network. So over time, the network learns to look at images and give us deformation fields. That kind of makes sense. So that's the general idea. It's fairly simple. You can play with all kinds of different networks. You can play with all kinds of representations of your deformation field. But at the end of the day, this is the, shit, the way that most um, deformation, uh, uh, sort of most registration field uh, networks work. Now it does. Um, when you want to register two new images at test time, it's really easy. You put in the net, uh, <laughs> you put in the images into the network, and you get out your deformation field, and that's it, right? So, um, any quick questions there? Just to make sure, if you don't understand something here, it's really important you do because all of the talk assumes you know this. We're all good. So the. Only registration information comes from the loss. Otherwise, you don't know how to register. Yeah, right. So the loss tells you what the output means in a way. Right. Yeah. OK, so first thing, time we did this, uh, two to three years ago, you know, we were still kind of new to this whole problem. So we thought, well, the best way to test whether this works is train a really massive network with a ton of, uh, a ton of data. Right, 7,000 images we gathered, all brain MRIs uh, from, I think, 10, 11 different data sets, huge amount of data, trained this network for 
think it was about a day and a half at the time. And then we wanted to look whether it does anything. And uh, the first thing we looked at was speed, right? We really care about, can this actually do well? And so um, here's a couple of baselines from the classical world, uh, iterative world. It was, these are good, very good software packages. Uh, ants, Nifty Reg, Ants took, it was very accurate, but it would take a couple hours. Um, Nifty Reg, also a very good uh, piece of software, it takes tens of minutes, depending on your settings. And then Voxomorph uh, took less than a minute on a CPU. Uh, once it's straight, right? Um, now it is maybe faster, about 30 seconds. And then less than a second on a GPU. Now, this is nice because you can uh, sort of go off for lunch and come back and you have a whole data set registered, um, which we did. But we need to know whether it's any good. And then if it is, we want to build sort of models that can build off of this and kind of do really interesting things. So is it any good? Well, how do we measure whether registration works? Looking at the two images after registration is not a good idea because it only tells you whether the image is matched. It doesn't tell you whether the deformation field did something really crazy to get them to match, something unreasonable. And so the way we do it is we outline or annotate images for evaluation purposes only. And then we warp one image onto the other. And then we also warp the segmentations. And so the idea is that after registration, we compare the segmentations. If the deformation fields are reasonable, the, the segmentations will now match up, right? And in this example, um, I, I started with these two images. I, I warped this image into this image, so it looks like this. And I can see that the segmentations match up pretty well, qualitatively at least. It does so for voxomorph, it does so for the baselines. So what about more quantitatively? Well, we're going to use DICE, which is a measure of uh, volume overlap. I'm sure everybody knows. Higher is better. And we're looking at different regions here. And the main conclusion here for voxomorph in yellow versus the baseline in orange is that really they behave the same, right? Basically the same result. And so this is good because voxomorph takes a fraction of the time from the baseline. So it's at least encouraging that we can achieve the same as this optimization, lengthy optimization process. All right, so what is this bias? What does this mean? Um, well, first I'm gonna make a couple of technical comments because I think they're important for later on. And then um, I'm gonna show you all kinds of properties of these numbers. So, um, right, so starting with analysis. Um, first of all, I'm gonna make, make a note. So on a technical side, what I just described is machine learning is uh, called amortized inference or amortized learning. The idea is we have some instance optimization that we want to use. In this case, it was registration for every, every image pair. But in medical imaging specific, specifically, we did a lot of things by running an instance specific optimization. And what we're doing here is we're teaching a network to approximate that optimization. So we're using the same loss function, but we're training a network to approximate it. And this is called amortized learning because you're amortizing over your entire data set to approximate that optimization. And then at the end of the day, you can get the result of the optimization for any new data. And so this process, while I described it for registration, applies very broadly. Uh, so I wanted to put that up there and I'm going to show you that you can generalize this more and more later on. But the other thing I wanted to mention is in our field, there's a lot of emphasis on uncertainty now, on probabilistic models. In registration, there's a lot of emphasis on diffeomorphic deformations, which are these very elegant deformation fields that preserve topology and have a lot of interesting mathematical properties. And what I want to say is that you can start with a lot of the classical elegant models. For example, 
a very nice probabilistic model between the two between two images. And when you try to invert this model, so for example, you want to find the optimal deformation field given two images in a probabilistic sense, you would normally come up with this very complicated uh, sort of solvers, but now you can approximate this probability distribution with neural nets. And so the advantage of this is you get not only your speed, but you get the property properties of the, the classical models, right? So you get uncertainty estimates, you get diffeomorphisms, all of these things we're able to do using the same trick. Okay, so let's talk about some properties of this whole thing. So um, the question that we got most often when we published Fox and Morph was, well, you know, this is great on 7,000 images that you trained with, but I only have 50. How well does the, do these networks hold up? And so that was a very good question. At the time, we didn't really think about um, how much data do we really need. And so we started doing analysis in this. And uh, so here, what I'm showing is training four different voxel morph models with different amounts of training data, 10, 25, 50, or 100. And I want to emphasize that there are no bells and whistles on this, these models at all. There's no data augmentation. There's no, not even batch norm. Partly because at the time we weren't um, really used to those, but partly because we're, we also want to understand what is sort of the floor of what these models can achieve. And so what you see here is that after, if you only train with 10 images, you get close to the state of the art, but not quite there, right, to the black line. But if you have 25, 50, 50 or 100 images, you already get within noise of the state of the art. So this means a couple of things. First of all, with just 50 images and no tricks, you already, you're, that's already enough to train these images. But with just 10 images, you're so close that you could optimize them just a little bit more. So you run your test image, test pair through the voxomorph, get the result, and optimize it a little bit more with a classical method on a GPU. And in just a few seconds, you can get back to the state of the art. So even when you just have very, 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 very little data, Voxomorph will still give you a, a, such a good initialization that it's tremendous savings anyway. So that was the first property that we were very happy to find. Another very interesting property is that classically, you know, we, we register these images but a lot of the times we don't actually care about analyzing the entirety of the image. We might care about, for example, analyzing the hippocampus uh, as an example. And so what we thought is that maybe we could help the neural net learn to focus on particular regions. If at training time and at training time only, we have a, a few images with segmentations. So let's say that at train time, we have five, 10 images where we've segmented, say, the hippocampus. We could tell the network, hey, don't just align the images, but make sure the hippocampus is aligned especially well. Now, this is added only as a loss. We don't want to require segmentations that train and like uh, as input to the network. That's quite a, a, a substantial assumption. So these networks only see the images, but the le they learn to focus on your segmentations as well. So internally, these networks probably learn to do a soft segmentation of some sort, so that they know where to where to focus. And so this is a relatively, I think conceptually it's very interesting, but from the implementation point of view, it's a, it's a really easy change to Voxomorph. And we quickly noticed the substantial improvement in registration. So this isn't just one or two dice points, we're talking 10 dice points 
for those structures that we had at train time. Now, again, at test time, these structures are not available, um, but the network learns to focus on those structures. Um, so this is an example of one of those things that we couldn't really do before, right? Because at test time, you don't really have the segmentation. So in an iterative, iterative process, you can't really emphasize, but here the networks have learned something. Okay, so this got us really thinking about how much data do you need? How specific are the networks focused on your data? How much, how much do they kind of only learn to register your data? And how, how do segmentations help? So we have this project called Synthmorph uh, led by Malta Hoffman as a postdoc. And um, the idea was, how do we teach, how do we learn networks that generalize very broadly? And the problem is specifically that in medical imaging, we have an awful lot of data that is imaging the same anatomy maybe, but it looks different, right? So here are four, uh, six different MRI scans of the same patient, but they look very different. And so this is a general problem in machine learning of, of generalization that I'm sure everybody knows, but specific to our cause, the question is, what if we only have the data in the top left, right? That first scan at train time, but we wanna generalize to all of the other scans because having to retrain the network every time is really not practically uh, useful, right? We can play with it in research, but if we really wanna deploy models, we really need them to generalize to new sequences, different sequences that people come up with. So how do we do this? And so we thought about this for a while and we came up with this idea that a very kind of blunt way to do it is to, to show the network an awful lot of contrasts, a lot, an awful lot of modalities, but let's assume that we don't have all the modalities that we want. One way to deal with this is to simulate an infinite number of modalities, essentially. And the idea isn't that we're going to be able to numerically loop over all possible modalities, but rather we're going to give the network crazy data that spans all kinds of different contrasts that we make up. And that's going to get the network used to the idea that it shouldn't focus on the exact intensity but it should try to extract the meaningful shapes. So let me show you what I mean. Now, we first did this in segmentation um, with uh, student Benjamin Bilo and, and uh, my colleague Eugenio Iglesias from UCL and, and uh, MGH. We first did it in segmentation. So the idea was, all right, we're going to assume the only data we have are some label maps some segmentation maps. Let's forget the data they came from. We're gonna assume we only have segmentation maps, okay? You can download these from one of the challenges or something. And now we're going to start with a label map and we're going to warp it in some random way. We're going to then fill in some random intensities for each label, okay? And then we're gonna add a bunch of artifacts. We're gonna add noise, we're gonna add blurring, bias field, we could add motion, anything you want. And that gives you the final image, okay? Now this image that I'm showing you, it's a little too sharp, but it looks realistic. It's got realistic contrasts. So what we really want is to expose a network to crazy contrasts. So this, for example, is a contrast you would never see out of a machine. The white matter is white on one side, dark on another. It doesn't make any sense, but it will expose the network to these crazy um, uh, varieties, telling the network it's not the intensity that matters, it's the difference of intensities between shapes. So we're gonna simulate these crazy contrasts. Um, and now the question is, so we did that in segmentation, but now uh, you know we're focused on registration here. How do we do this with registration? Well, we start with one label map, we warp it in two different ways. 
we simulate two different images. And these images look very, very different, right? Different contrasts, and they don't make any sense on, um, from an MR point of view. But we're hoping this will teach the network how to ignore the intensities. Now, we started doing this, and as I'm going to show you, this works well. But we realized, you know, registration networks don't really care what you're registering. They really just match up shapes. So why should we constrain ourselves to label maps of the brain? So we did this process for completely random label maps. Label maps we completely came up with. They look something like this. So you come up with these random labels, the blobs or shapes. You warp them in two different ways. You fill in intensities, artifacts, noise, all kinds of things. And then you feed this to the network. So here's a bunch of different um, uh, brains. Here's a bunch of different images, right? And we take these and we feed them to the network. And we tell the network, OK, you're only seeing these images. Can you make sure they match up? Now, of course, how do we teach the network that these images match up? It's really hard because the contrasts are not the same anymore. Uh, we have loss functions that match up different contrasts, but they're not that robust uh, in the face of this really, really crazy set of images. So what we thought was, well, but we have the segmentations that produce the images, right? So we can tell the network, here are the images, but we need you to align the segmentations that produce the images. So what this does is it tells the network, ignore the contrast. We don't really we don't really care about the intensity. What we care about is for you to realize that underlying these images, there are shapes. And those anatomical shapes need to be matched up. So these, these networks never see any real data, right? They see shapes, either random shapes of brains or random shapes. Uh, uh, sorry, they see images made from shapes. Right, random images uh, that look something like this. Now, we train two networks and we call this model SynthMorph because it comes from synthesized data. Two networks, one of them trained on synthesized brains, the other one trained on synthesized shapes. Okay. And now we're going to compare on real data, right? So these are real brains. And first, I'm just going to look at registering within modalities that we actually have data for. And I have three classes of, of uh, me methods here. In red are classical iterative methods. These methods are really robust because every time they see a new pair of images, they really optimize some loss function to those images. In green are voxel morph models trained on these data, so on real data, right? They see T1 brains or they see T2 brains. And then in blue are, are the new models, the synth morph models that are trained on completely fake data. Now, the first thing to observe is when you register T1 to T1 or T2 to T2, it's all kind of the same. Voxel morph models are a little bit better than, than classical models. Synth morph models are basically about the same as voxel morph models, maybe a little bit better. Now, the interesting thing is even this model that only ever saw shapes, never saw even a real shape of a brain, it just saw, you know, kind of random blobs. Even this model does pretty well. And then, of course, if it sees fake images of brains, it does even better. But it's not a huge gain. Of course, what we're really interested in is when these networks see modalities they've never seen before. So for example, registering T1 to some other modality is never seen before. And so here's what happens. PD is a new modality, a modality we didn't have available during training. And so this uh, fourth column here, you're registering T1 to PD. Now, classical models do OK. They lose a little bit of accuracy. That's because PD doesn't have as much contrast to show you the shapes. Voxel morph, though, collapses completely. 
Why? Because it's never seen PD. So it does something completely undefined. It says, I've never seen this data. I don't know what to do. But surprisingly, SynthMorph does really, really well. It does better than the classical models and substantially better than VoxMorph, right? And it does this on T1 to PD, but it also does this on T1 to T2, both um, uh, modalities we had during training, but VoxelMorph was not, it was only trained T1 to T1 or T2 to T2. So this synthetic models do really, really well when seeing new modalities or cross modality, even though they've never actually seen any real data. So this tells us something interesting here that networks can be trained with completely synthetic data uh, to be very robust to changes in the distribution of, of, of uh, your available test data, right? So it makes them really robust to contrast, which I think is very interesting. Um, so they do really well overall. Now we, we poked quite a bit at why is it that this happens? And so first, we did this experiment where we had the same pair of brains. Okay, so these are the same brains. And the second brain, we vary the contrast smoothly. We change the contrast, right? So this first uh, pair here has the same contrast between the two brains, but then the brain contrast changes here and now it's a very different contrast. And what we see is that the classical models in red, they do okay, they start suffering a little bit, but they're mostly okay. The voxel morph models collapse as soon as the contrast changes substantially. And then the synth morph models maintain their accuracy quite well. So this shows that it's not just very particular contrasts it does well on, but it rather just maintains the level regardless of what the contrasts look like. And so we looked inside the network to try to understand why this is. And in particular, we gave it again, same brains, but different contrasts. And we try to look at what the features look like, right? What do the features inside of the networks look like? So for voxelmorph, if we look at these four different input pairs, the last feature in the network looks different, right? It's got different intensities. And this is because it responds differently to different contrasts. It thinks that the contrast, it thinks that the intensities are important. And so it encodes those into features. And it uses those to make its prediction of deformation fields. In contrast, SynthMorph completely ignores the intensities. It doesn't matter what the intensities are. By the last feature, it ignores the intensities and somehow isolates the shapes or maybe the edges between intensities or something like this, right? So you can see that the feature is the same regardless of the contrast that is input. And we can look at this, you know, different, uh, different features and we see the same behavior. That basically normal networks are very susceptible to the input contrast, but SynthMorph is not at all. It's learned to ignore it. Um, and one last note, just as a caveat, these networks, because they're exposed to so much, they need to be larger, right? So um, a lot of voxelmorph models that we work with, 32 features at every convolutional layer, 64 maybe, that's enough. For these networks, if you go to 256, you're still improving, right? So here, uh, the dice numbers actually disappeared off the y-axis, I apologize, but we're looking at five, six dice improvement. So in this case, bigger network is important. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick break there. I see there's one question in the uh, Q&A, but also feel free to interrupt if there's any other questions.
Yeah, so the question is, uh, thanks for the talk. I have a question about the unsupervised registration loss in the voxel morph model. What is the similarity loss in here? Is it simple, simply mean square error or derivative mutual information? Yeah, so it's a great question. So all of these losses work. Um, we found cross-correlation to be the best, but sometimes it's not the most robust. So cross if, if it's within modality, then cross-correlation will give you sort of the, the best dice, you know, the last half a percent dice compared to mean squared error. But sometimes it can get stuck in local minima. So that's kind of our experience. Normalized mutual information, we also have uh, coded and played with. It works okay uh, for between modality um, registration or even within modality registration, but it's certainly more finicky. There are different parameters you have to play with and you know how many bins, uh, soft bins and so on. All of these you can uh, try at foxamorph.net. So we have all these losses implemented and you're free to try them. Thank you. And, sure. Uh, any other questions or no? I, should, I can move on. Uh, I do have questions, but I'll yeah. ask them later. Oh, you'll ask them later. Okay, sure. So I'm going to shift gears here to, again, very similar to the uh, previous section in the sense that I'm going to tackle a problem within registration, but this is a very general problem that I think applies broadly, and we are tackling it in other problems. And that is the problem of hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and I'm sure most people on this call, if you've trained models, you feel the love and hate relationship with this. We, for any model, we have hyperparameters of all sorts, right? Model hyperparameters, optimization hyperparameters, loss hyperparameters, and so on and so on. Now, what I'm going to talk about applies broadly to a lot of classes of hyperparameters. I'm going to focus on loss hyperparameters, hyperparameters that either affect a particular loss term or hyperparameters that balance out loss terms. I think these are very important in a lot of the problems we work with and especially in registration. So how do you balance, for example, the similarity loss with the re regularization loss, right? There's this lambda in between. How do we, how do we tune this? Well, what we usually do uh, is we take a guess, maybe take two or three guesses. We train a model to completion. We look at some validation data. And OK, this gives us an idea where the best parameter is, but it's not perfect. We go back. We train a bunch more models. We look at the results. Now, that's usually what happens, unfortunately, for your own model. Most often, if you're comparing with other models, you just take whatever they used in their, in their paper. That's not a good idea. It's not, it's not really fair to that model. But you know, we only have so many GPU cycles. And so people are going to take these shortcuts. At the end of the day, all of this results in a lot of GPU usage and an awful lot of headache, right? It's so much headache that it has a name, it's graduate student descent, right? Because it's an awful lot of work for the graduate students to keep searching for these hyperparameters. Now, there's another problem that we don't know about as well, which is that hyperparameters are not really this thing that is optimal for everything. So if you find an op a hyperparameter that is really, really good on the data set you trained on, that does not at all mean that that's good on the data set you'll test or a new data set that someone else will test on. In fact, most of the time it's not. So here is Voxomorph trained on a GSP data set. Y axis is dice, higher is better. X axis is the hyperparameter that balances those two terms. So 0 0.25 is optimal, right? Well, the problem is if we look at a different data set, a different hyperparameter is optimal. And this is despite the fact that we normalized the images, we um, did all this stuff to kind of get them in the same space. And you know, there's a different data set abide, different optimal hyperparameter. In fact, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking at the hippocampus, you're going to want a different hyperparameter than if you're looking at the ventricle. So even after you do all that work and you get your model and you're really happy, might not be the best model. So that's really painful. 
right? And so what we're going to propose here is not going to be, here's how to get the optimal hyperparameter. Again, because I don't think there is one. But I'm going to propose a model that alleviates all that effort and the runtime. And the idea is to train just one model. Instead of training many models and iterating and all that, you're going to train just one model. And this model is going to encapsulate all of the possible hyperparameter values for the hyperparameters you care about. Now, it turns out this makes your life easier, but it also turns out this model doesn't need to be that big because models with slightly different hyperparameter values are actually kind of the same model. So here's the idea. Okay, now again, I'm gonna show it in registration. It applies to a lot of that stuff. Here's a registration network. We're very familiar with it now, right? Two images go into a network, it's really fast, gives you the deformation, and then you need to do some stuff to compute your losses. Okay, there's this hyperparameter. So we're gonna take this hyperparameter, we're gonna put it into the network. Okay, we're gonna pass it to the network somehow. I'll talk about how. Now, what does this mean to the network? Well, if this hyperparameter is also the one that's used in the loss, then every time uh, the network gets two images, it's going to also look at the hyperparameter value. So let's say the hyperparameter value is very low, close to zero. Then hyper, the network will say, well, I'm just gonna give you a, a deformation field that doesn't matter if it's smooth or not, because I know that's going to give me a good loss, because I know that the regularization term in the loss doesn't matter, right? Or let's say I give you a hyper uh, parameter value that's really high. Now the network is going to look at that and say, oh, I'm gonna give you a very smooth deformation field. Very smooth. Because I know you really care about the smoothness because that's what's going to be evaluated in the loss, right? So the idea is that by passing this hyperparameter value as input to the network, the network will adapt the result to what the hyperparameter means. Okay. Any quick questions there? Because I think it's maybe not you know, the easiest concept. I'm very interested how you get that into your loss. Well, OK, all right, good. So there's, so there's two, two tasks, right? How do I get this into the network, and how do I get this into the loss? Actually, the loss is easy. At every iteration, I, I sample a value for this hyperparameter. And that's the one I use in the loss for that iteration. That's it, right? So the loss is like A plus lambda B. So at every iteration, the loss is slightly different because it's the, that hyperparameter will appear in the loss, okay? So at every iteration, it changes, the loss changes. The second part is how do I get this into the network? So we tried this. We had a fully connected layer. You get your little hyperparameter fully connected to your whole network and do everything the same way. And it didn't work at all. And you know, we struggled with this for a while. Why doesn't it work? It turns out it's a very difficult task for your network to combine the hyperparameter with the images and affect the deformation field. It tries to do something meaningful, but it's really hard. And so then we thought, well, what we really want is we want for every deformation, for uh, every hyperparameter value, we really want the network to change a little bit, right? So we put this little network in front that says, okay, it, I take the hyperparameter value, I do some uh, nonlinearities with it. And then this network, which we call a hyper network now, is going to output the weights of the voxel morph network. So this hyperparameter value is going to determine how voxel morph looks like. Okay. So what this is doing is slightly different than just doing a fully connected layer because this actually changes the function 
of registration, right? So instead of having a function that takes three inputs, you're now changing the function of the two inputs. Now, of course, like most things we do, you do this, you get excited. It turns out someone did it in machine learning for a very different task, very different world, very different scope, very different whatever, but they did it and they're called hyper networks. Okay? And it's this idea that you have a network sitting on top of the main network you care about and it modulates the weights. So the only learnable parameters here are in the hyper network. The registration network no longer has any learnable parameters because their parameters come from the hyper network. They're the output of the hyper network, if you will. Okay. So that's it. That's the entire strategy, right? We have, we learn a single model where we feed in random hyperparameters. Those hyperparameters teach the hyper network what it needs to do. And those hyperparameters appear in the loss. And so over time, the hope is that hypermorph, which is what we're calling this, learns that, oh, if the hyperparameter is low, I give you this type of deformation. If it's high, I give you this other type of deformation. So let's see how that works. Now, this is what we're using right now. Again, this is broadly applicable to hyperparameters, but this is what we're using right now. One problem is the range of this hyperparameter value, uh, this hyperparameter, well, it's zero to infinity, right? You could always crank it up. It's hard to sample from zero to infinity. So we changed the loss a little bit by um, adding this one minus lambda. So now we know that it ranges from zero to one. Okay, it's the same thing and it has the same meaning, but we're just kind of clamping the range. Okay, so here's what we did. Frame 10 voxel morph models, okay? Now these are slightly beefier voxel morph models because uh, we were dealing with uh, uh, sort of different images. So beefy voxel morph models, 10 of them, okay, for 10 different hyperparameter values. And here's what it looks like, right? We can tell that the optimal hyperparameter val uh, value for this data set is around 0 0.15 to 0 0.2, somewhere there. We're not sure, but it's around there, right? So even with 10, we're not sure. Maybe you'd want to run a few more. Now, this took 40 GPU days, um, so it's a lot. And then we ran just one, trained one hypermorph model, right? And it looks something like this. So remember, hypermorph has as input the lambda value. So we just span this lambda value and we see that it matches the baselines almost perfectly, right? This is just one model, right? And it matches the baselines perfectly. Now, that's promising. It shows that this mechanism can approximate, approximate the landscape of voxel morph models, but you know, how long does it actually take to train? Because if it takes as long as 10 voxel morph models, it doesn't matter, right? So uh, we did this for cross correlation. It turns out whatever loss function you use, it kind of works. Um, it matches the baselines, right? So a lot of GPU hours spent to do these experiments. So here's what happens. One voxel morph model on the left, one hypermorph model on the right. Hypermorph takes a little longer than a single voxel morph model. Right, one to two, uh, sorry, 1.5 to two X uh, uh, runtime, it takes longer, right? But you have to train a bunch of voxelmorph models, sometimes in parallel, sometimes in series, sometimes you iterate. And so the savings is huge. Now, it's huge because if you ran 10 voxelmorph models in series, it would take 10 times as long. If you take train some of them in parallel, you're taking up all the GPU, you're upsetting all your you know, collaborators. The really big problem that I cannot, unfortunately, put in a graph is the headache savings, right? I know from being a postdoc until very recently and from being a student and from seeing all my students how incredibly difficult it is to tune these, right? To always, oh, I train a bit, I need to fine tune and tables and this. I cannot measure that yet. But the savings is enormous, 
right? Um, now, it turns out that once you've done this, it's actually also an enormously powerful model to have around because, well, first of all, how do you choose the best haptimal haptoparameter? One way to do it, and one way that we actually did it a lot classically is visually. So the nice thing here is that I can just very quickly turn this knob and every time I turn it, it runs through the network, through Hypermorph and very quickly show me what that registration would look like. And so you can imagine this has a lot of uses, right? For radiologists, for researchers, very easily you can, you can sort of tune your hyperparameter value for a particular subject, for a particular data set, interactively, right? This is something that we can't really do otherwise. I mean, we could have five different trained models and jump between them, but besides the complication of doing that, you know, you only get those values. You don't get the values in between. Um, you could also classically do it. Every time you turn the knob, you rerun your optimization, but that takes forever. So this is a, a new tool that you can use interactively. But of course, we also have segmentation sometimes. And so the really, really nice thing about Hypermorph is you can tune the hyperparameter automatically if you have some validation set using gradient descent. So here's how that works. And this is really easy and really powerful. Here's Hypermorph. We're going to fix all the, hyper, all the parameters. All the parameters that you learned, they're fixed. But now what we're going to do is we're going to tune the hyperparameter value itself. We're going to treat it as a parameter and we're going to run gra uh, <laughs> graduate descent. We're going to try, run gradient descent on it. How? Well, we assume we have a little bit of validation data, right? So some segmentations. And so now we're going to say, okay, give us the optimal, run a, a standard gradient descent optimization on the uh, hyperparameter that gives us the best segmentation overlap, right? And so this isn't learning the network, it's just tuning the, the parameter, but it's tuning it automatically with very fine precision. So let's say I have, I trained my model, I'm all happy. Now I have test data sets and I have four different test data sets. And I know that four different test data sets means four different optimal hyperparameter values, right? Because hopefully I convinced, convinced you of that. So let's see how we do that. Well, we take a little bit of validate, we, we need a little bit of validation data in each of those data sets. And then we optimize the hyperparameter value and Here's the result we get, right? And so the curves I'm showing for visualization, but the, the circles are the optima that this optimization finds. So we see very quickly that you can get the optimal value, you can get it with high precision, and it's different for different data sets. So for example, if you had used the GSP data set optimal, to do analysis for the abide data set in orange, you'd be in trouble, right? It's a 2% loss just because you're using the wrong hyperparameter value. So this gives you this ability to choose the best hyperparameter value for your own analysis. This one model that we've trained, right? Now, it's not just data sets, right? The type of modality that you have varies in terms of optimal hyperparameter. Right, so again, here's sort of the substantial difference. Um, different registration tasks, if you're doing within the same subject, so before and after, uh, you know, some time has passed, versus within or uh, between subjects. Even anatomy, right? So if you care about the hippocampus, that means you might want to choose a different hyperparameter value than if you care about, say, the ventricles. So all of this is possible with Hypermorph, very quick hyperparameter, automatic hyperparameter tuning at test time. Now, I told you about one hyperparameter, but of course the strategy is very general. You could choose, you know, there might be two or three hyperparameter values that are really important to your problem. So what happens then? Well, the savings is even bigger 
right? Because now, you know, the, the, the great search that you would need to do in, in a standard way is really exhaustive. But you only need to train one hypermorph model or hyperparameter model, right? It's still just one. Um, I'm not going to go into details, uh, but I, I do have slides if people ask. Basically, it's the same idea. A hypermorph model, a single hypermorph model is able to approximate your entire grid search, which means that it enables well, faster training, but also very fast tuning and very precise tuning at testing. Now, there's a bunch of properties that you also get, which are really nice. We didn't anticipate them, but they're really nice. One of them is these models are incredibly stable to initialization. We're not sure why, but we think it's because you're initializing the hypernet, not the main registration network. And so, you know, every time you reinitialize a network like Voxelmorph, you'll get slightly different result. But that variance is much higher with Voxelmorph than it is with Hypermorph. So it's sort of a really nice property. It also leads to less training. Now, you don't need to initialize five times and take the best model because you know it's pretty stable. Um, it's, it's, oh, sorry, I just, it's, um, uh, the other thing we, we tested was that hyper network size we thought would be really important, right? So we thought, oh, well, um, it's a really, really small network. So maybe if we make it much bigger, it will have a bigger impact, but it will take longer to train. It turns out neither of those things are true. If you go a little bigger, you get improvement, but it turns out it doesn't need to be really big. So with just 128 hidden layers, five layers of 128 hidden layers, it's already substantially, um, it, it already does as well as all your baselines. But the thing that was spectacular to us was that there was no difference in training a small hypernet versus a big hypernet. And we think the reason for this is because most of the time that is spent in training is in the convolutions of the voxelmorph model, not in the hypernet. So the hypernet is this incredibly powerful, but fast and small thing, which is a bit of a surprise to us. All right. Um, so, oh, just a technical note. Remember how I mentioned amortized learning? So classical models, you know, you give it two images, you give it a hyperparameter, it does the optimization. Then we have voxelmorph. It approximates that optimization for every hyperparameter value, right? In voxelmorph, we fix the hyperparameter value, and now it'll approximate the classical models. So another layer of that is what hypermorph does, which is it approximates the effect of a hyperparameter value on voxelmorph. So it's another layer of amortization. Yeah, that was just a quick technical note. All right, I do have one more section um, to talk about. I think we're okay, right? Like it's, it, we can go, I can keep going. Yeah, yeah. sure, we have time. Yeah. All right, cool. I wanted to make sure. So it sounds like I'm gonna take questions at the end. So, so you know, save them. Um, this is something that's been close to my heart for a while. Um, and it's, it's uh, focuses on building templates. So, when we launched Voxelmorph, we had a lot of feedback that was about, well, how, you know, I have this data set and it's maybe of some other anatomy or it's of, of brains, but it's, it's a very specific distribution. Uh, you know, maybe it's young patients or something. Um, and, and the templates that exist out there, the, the sort of common reference frames are not appropriate. What do I do? And so, Building templates is an interesting um, direction. So the way they're usually done is you have a bunch of data, you estimate a, a template, you know, to start. It's, it's you know, you, you take one of your subjects as the template or you average all your subjects, you know, to a very blurry average. And then you do the following process. Take all your images, register them to your template and take an average. That gives you a slightly better average. Take your, all your images, register them again, that's better. 
register them again, it's better. So classically, this takes forever, right? But it gives really nice templates. It's how a lot of templates are done. It's not the only way. It's how a lot of templates are done. Now, one um, thing we started thinking about was, well, you, you know, you could use Voxelmorph here and speed up that process. But we thought, well, Voxelmorph itself kind of learned something about the entire distribution, right? It's a, it's a network. And this network approximates, in some way, features about your data set. So we stared at this and we realized, well, when we teach uh, Voxelmorph to register to a template, what we do is we take a bunch of images and one template. And we give, at every iteration, we give it the template and an image, then the template and another image, then the template and another image. What if we didn't have the template and we just told Voxelmorph, hey, you have this unknown image. Why don't you approximate the template at every location? So the only change is now one of the inputs is no longer an input. It is a set of parameters at every voxel. At every voxel, it's a parameter. It's, a, it's the intensity to be learned, right? So you do the same thing, same stochastic gradient based network training. But now the network is not just going to learn how to register images, but it's also going to register what is the one global entity that all these images could be registered to, to have good similarity scores, right? And so that's it, that's the change. Again, very small change, but with a very powerful effect of giving you a template for your data set, right? So this is the template that first came from those uh, images that we first used in, in the Voxelmorph training. And it's a pretty nice, uh, uh, it's a pretty nice template considering we haven't modeled anything about brains here. We haven't specifically used anything regarding brains. We just sort of said, give us the best thing that you would register to. And so um, this was exciting. But again, it's all about what can you do with this that you couldn't do before. And one thing we got really excited about is, is the potential to build templates that are not just one image. So a lot of the times you have a very rich data set, right? You have a data set that spans 15 year olds to 90 year olds. It spans healthy and a particular disease. It, sp uh, it spans different genetic distributions. So now, what do you do? One template does not represent all those uh, patients or subjects. And what people normally do is, uh, if they don't use one template, is they will put the data set into buckets. You know, the younger, more middle-aged, older patients, or something like that. And they will learn different templates. But the problem with that is, it gets very tricky. How do you choose the buckets? You don't have enough data in every bucket anymore, all this sort of stuff. And so we thought, okay, well, what if we don't learn a template, but we learn a template as a function of an attribute we care about? So instead of learning you know, one image, we're going to learn this little network here. And it's a network that goes from attributes we care about, like age or sex or genetics or whatever, and this network is going to give us the best template for those attributes. So let's say I have 45-year-old female with a particular APOE mutation. This network will give me the best brain for that, um, for those uh, properties. Right? Now, how do we train this? Again, really not a big change. I'm just letting the network learn, but at every, at every input, I take the image I have and I need the attributes for that image, right? So age, let's say, let's say I'm only focusing on age. I need the age of that, um, uh, that the person was when that image was taken, right? And that's it. Then I train Voxomorph as normal. And over time, the network will learn this, uh, this uh, uh, little function here. Right. So how does that look like? Well, here's the result. So here are atlases for 15 year olds. Here's atlases for 90 year, 90 year olds. This is a little hard to see like this. So I'm going to show you a video. <laughs> 
right? So here I'm showing the age changing, and I'm going to show this a couple of times. You can see there's atrophy. Uh, you can see the ventricles in the middle are growing, right? You can see around the cortex, the edge of the brain, the, the brain is shrinking. Now, in some ways, it's a very sad video, right? But essentially, it captures the important uh, changes in the brain that we know happen because of you know wonderful studies people have done. Uh, we know, we can see that the hippocampus shrinks. We can see that the ventricles expand. But the remarkable thing here to me was that we never told this model anything about anatomy. We didn't tell it that the anatomy has to change smoothly. We didn't tell it it has to shrink or change or whatever. We just taught the, the network from data. Of course, you can combine this model with richer and richer modeling constraints, which we're really excited about doing. But the, the really, really neat thing is data was enough already to give us a really, really nice um, start. Now we've tried this on a bunch of different stuff with Lila Zoli. We tried it on pediatric data. The interesting thing there is that for really, really young patients, their um, uh, neurobiology will change. So they'll go through myelination effects and you'll get these flips in intensities. This is the same modality. And you can see how the white matter, for those of you who know neuroanatomy, you can see that the white matter changes uh, in intensity, which is really nice. Um, We've recently done a project with uh, Neil Day. Ah, this was accepted at ICCB. I should change that slide. But this is a uh, student, Neil Day, and Guido Garrick's group at NYU, who has uh, put an again an adversary on this process to make sure that the the anatomy is more constrained and sharper. Right, so the images look sharper. Again, this is on on young patients. Um, and so on. So we're really, really excited about directions for this project because it enables us to combine the idea of learning representations uh, from data, but also not just learning these abstract representations that are in neural networks, but also learning the sort of representations that um, you know, neuroscientists and, and general uh, clinicians are very familiar with. And so they can sort of trust the model is a lot better and they give us a, a, a sort of um, common reference frame to analyze all these images. All right, so before I summarize the talk, I want to acknowledge the uh, incredible people that have been part of these various projects. Uh, Guha Balakrishnan, importantly, was uh, the student who started this work. Um, we, we sort of thought of this project and he implemented it and got results in incredible, uh, incredible uh, uh, sort of small amount of time. I think within just three or four days, we already had results. Um, and all of these other people, I think one person I forgot to explicitly um, call out was Andrew Hoops, who is the first author of Hypermorph. He just presented that at ITME. Um, and, and all these other uh, people uh, that, that have been part of the projects all along the way. Um, so, the, the real idea between, be, behind voxel morph is, has been about combining concepts from classical models like loss functions, probabilistic models, diffeomorphisms, all of that, but then using the power of machine learning to do substantially faster inference. And combining those two advantages gives us all kinds of um, sort of properties going forward. It gives us fast registration, really good accuracy, uh, topologically consistent deformations, uncertainty estimates, which I didn't have time to talk about. Um, it allows us to work with very limited training data. It allows us to take advantage of segmentations, simulated data. It allows us to build atlases, and it's allowed us to sort of explore projects like Hypermorph that are very general, but it's a really nice sandbox to work in. Um, and with that, I want to thank all of you for attention and questions, and I look forward to a discussion. Thank you. Adrian, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. Really wonderful work. And I, I have some applause here. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to work with pre-recorded knocking on the table. But if you were here, we would enthusiastically knock on our tables for this presentation. Really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Great work and really impressive what you've been doing in trainable registrations.
it's it's really amazing. I have a couple of questions, and um, I'm just wondering. So, what I've seen in image reconstruction lately happening is that people are not just um, training like the the reconstruction process, but they also try to embed the iterative procedure, so the optimization, into like uh, train a a five to ten iteration approach that then also includes data consistency. Is anything like this also popular in, in image registration? Or it's a, it, it's a great question. So I um I guess I'm of two minds. So the image consistency thing is a slightly different because here you know you're not doing reconstruction. So I guess you would think of it differently. But whether or not unrolling the optimization uh -huh. is useful, um I, well, I'll be explicit. I don't know, but I've seen some work that does, I wouldn't quite call it unrolling, but it does a sort of cascading of networks, right? So you, you take one network and uh, you kind of repeat the process. So you ask the first network to do as good of a uh, reg uh, registration as it can, and then you register the images and there's another, another network that improves it and you train that end to end. Um, so there's a couple of papers out there to do that. They do claim uh, better accuracy. Um, the improvement is not substantial. It's 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 you know one dice, but it is you know statistically significant. So so I think that gets you something. But I think um, I think part of the problem, part of the reason why the improvements are not substantial is that. A lot of our work has been on tasks that I would claim that now we've more or less solved them. Like we're more or less to the point where we're arguing about half a dice to one dice. Mm -hmm. What we've been doing and what some of the other uh, groups in the field have been doing is um, starting to look at other very substantially different data sets where our registration is quite poor. So uh, Matthias Heinrich, for example, has his whole research life has been focusing on other data sets like lungs and, and abdomen where the registration task is very different. There's these, it, maybe we care less about minute details like you care about in the brain, but there's substantial motion that you want to look at. Mm -hmm. And there, sometimes their algorithms work and sometimes they don't work at all. And so um, I suspect that one direction where the cascades will make more impact is in those other domains. That's I'm, it's a hypothesis, but I think the impact will be that bigger there. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think the, these approaches are really popular, f in particular reconstruction, because you can also learn the regularizers. So you you right. don't have to specify the regularizer. I'm not sure if that. Uh, is something because you, you you use many different regular uh, regularizers typically for different tasks in registration, right? Yeah, um, it's a good question whether that applies or not. Um, I, I'm not sure. I guess I'm not sure. It's you know worth applying those concepts and seeing if that's possible. Um, a regularizer is somewhat subjective here. I mean, I, it is in, in reconstruction as well, but here it depends a lot on like two different researchers might choose different regularizers because they care about slightly different things or they have a different opinion of what is too smooth or not smooth enough. So it's somewhat subjective and, you know, the entire registration is subjective. So for that reason, I'm not sure if it maps. And, and some things are also difficult to describe, like what makes a good image. And right. I mean, you look at it and you see, okay, yeah, that's a good image or not. Right. And then you come up with these heuristics. And so it's it's an interesting uh, line of research that's, that's happening there. And I For sure. thought that it may be also interesting uh, in image registration. But then again, if you're already that good, <laughs> then uh, it's it's probably not so so interesting to think about that. Right. Yeah. I think I think it's. Well, I think the field has gotten really good at registering brain image healthy or not healthy brain images without tumors. You know. Yeah, and to some extent, what you do in hypermorph uh, also lo solves partially that problem because. Once you have the regularizer, you still need a hyperparameter, and 
Right. And this is this is also something that has a big influence. And I think you pointed it out very well in the talk. The graduate student descent has often a really large impact and only a few people actually talk about it. So. Yeah, I, exactly. I agree very much. And I think part of the reason few people talk about it is, well, maybe part of the reason is, is it's hard to quantify on sort of the student's behalf. But I think the other part is it's just hard you know, just hard to put a number on it at all. Like, how are we going to agree about how much, you know, how much effort did we spend on it? I, you know, I don't know. Um, so in some ways, I was actually quite afraid that it'd be difficult to publish this because, yeah, how do you, how do you know how much it's done? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, apparently it's, it's been well received. So. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced by what you presented today. I'm, I'm... <laughs> Thanks. I'm super excited that we have many things where we would like to apply this as well, because we face exactly the same problem. So right. it's, it's a super cool method. I'm, I'm yeah, so cool. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, so I should mention the code is, you know, it's right there. So if you want to try a hyper, you know, we have it applied to, um, to a unit in general. So, you know, if you want to apply it to segmentation or something, we have applied it to other things like segmentation and data augmentation, which is another place where you have a lot of, you know, hyperparameter tuning, how much do you augment and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've applied it to a few things and I think it's broadly applicable. So you can just go and use the code. You, um, I, I really want to go ahead and try this. I think it's cool. Uh, <laughs> and I think it will solve many of our problems. So there's a question here from, from our audience. Um, if the hyperparameters were jumping back and forth, could it impact on the convergence of the training or making the convergence impossible? So it's, it's a good question that I've gotten a few times. So when someone says, and maybe the person who asked this can jump in. And so when someone says, if they're jumping back and forth, um, I think the assumption is that we are optimizing the hyperparameter, right? But we're not. So I want to emphasize that. We're not optimizing the hyperparameter we're, uh, when we train the main network, right? What we're doing is we're teaching the network the effect of the hyperparameter. So let's say that the landscape of the hyperparameters is that it does really well on the hyperparameter is low, it does really well on the hyperparameter is high, and it does really poorly otherwise. So you get these two humps, right? Then you might say, well, how are you going to optimize that? But we don't want to optimize. We just want the network to know that. We want the network to know you do well here, you do poorly over here. And so it actually doesn't impact the optimization too much, right? Because you're not, you're not caught in a local minima or anything like that. And that's because when we train, we're sampling from this range, right? We're not, we're not taking steps along the derivative. We're sampling from this range. Now, you might get stuck in the local minima at test time when you're optimizing the hyperparameter value. But that's not really an issue related to hypermorph. It's an issue with the fact that you have two optimal hyperparameter values and it's an ill-defined problem, right? Um, you could get around that, right? You can initialize the search, you know, in five different ways. It doesn't matter because it's really, really quick, right? Um, you know, I want to point out that this would be substantially worse if you're doing a, a grid search, right? Because you're likely going to find one of the peaks and you're going to focus your grid search on that and you're not going to know about the other peak. Uh, but Hypermorph, it'll just approximate that landscape. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful work. Um, there's, there's one more question. Um, so in Synthmorph, also very impressive work, by the way. Um, so th did you think about comparing this or incorporating some, some cycle gun type of approaches? I mean, th th there's a couple of, of things that come as constraints if you use cycle guns and you very elegantly get around them. So Yeah. Yeah. So I think the core of that question is about making the images more realistic, which is what the GANs would mm -hmm. help you with, right? And so I am of two minds on that. If you want to make the image realistic, you need a, if you want to do it with an adversary style, the adversary needs to see real data. And so now 
you are in trouble because you are in this regime where you depend on your real data, at least in part. Now, maybe there's ways around that. There's maybe there's a way to make an adversary that's data independent. I don't know. But, but now you're in that regime. Nevertheless, I think adding realism to your data somehow is important. So the answer is GANs are fun to, to explore, but I'm not convinced that they will help. And we have thought about it, we really have, but it, I'm not sure. But the wonderful thing about medical imaging is there's, there's this enormous amount of work on the forward models, right? Like we know how we go from an MRI acquisition to the image itself. We know how motion in the scanner affects it. We know how noise affects it. We know how CT works. And so the great thing about those forward models is when you're simulating, you just need to simulate the forward model. So to make an image more realistic, it's pretty easy. You add motion, you add noise, you add, you know, you can just add these things. And so recently, uh, you know, we have a, a grant on this stuff and a reviewer kindly suggested that we simulate more realistic effects. And we did, and it indeed, it makes these, these models, you know, the images look more realistic. You know, you get a little motion, a little ghosting, a little, you know, and the resulting models, registration, segmentation, become very resilient to those processes. So I think, you know, the answer to your question is we haven't tried GANs. I think they're interesting, but I'm not sure they'll solve the problem. However, there's a lot of realism we can inject into the models, a lot more left to do um, that we can do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just when people talk about synthetic images, then GANs always kind of pop up. For sure. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's why I had to ask a question like that one. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we get asked all the time. I mean, it's... it's yeah. Adrian, this was wonderful research. And you're also launching editor of a new journal called Melba. Can you tell us about, yeah. about this journal and what the idea is? <laughs> Great, I, fantastic. We, Thanks for letting... I, yeah, think, no, it's, it's, I think it's fascinating. So more right. fascinating. So, so um, it's, a, it's a very small team led by uh, Tyler Bell on that, you know, I think came from this, um, this issue with the fact that the journals nowadays are, very, not, are not open enough, right? So we all know the story, right? Everybody, the researchers work really hard and they publish and these are, and, and the resulting publications are either behind paywalls or they cost an enormous amount of money. And the effect nowadays is that everybody goes on archive and reads the papers. And so we, so I think the team wants the best of both worlds, right? We want really thorough reviews that we can provide to the community, but we want the entire process to be open. And so what Melba is, is it's trying to achieve that. It's trying to be a premier journal that is open. There is a cost to, to a, an accepted paper, which is just $10, and that's just to kind of keep the servers going. The um, papers are hosted on archive once they're accepted. And um, other than that, you get all the good stuff from a, from a top journal, right? So we get uh, a really high bar, you get uh, really thorough reviews and thorough, uh, I know there's an awful lot of attention on the editorial process right now so that you know we help the projects along and we get really good publications and so it's in its first year it it started with an special issue edition uh on middle so i guess i guess middle last year so i guess we just finished our first year there's something like 15 papers that have been published um, and we're getting, you know, a lot of attention now. I think people really like this model. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, the summary of it. Sorry, it's not, it's not a well-rehearsed uh, uh, pitch, but that's, that's the summary. And we're really excited. So please uh, submit, uh, because I, I think you'll be, you'll be happy with the process and you'll be happy with the openness of the result. Absolutely. I think this is the right step at the right time that you are taking here. And I'm, I'm really excited that such a journal is now also coming to the medical imaging community. So this is, I think, the absolute right thing to do. And 
people should know about this and also you know, show that there are really top scientists involved like like you and with this wonderful research. Adrian, thank you for coming here. Thank you for visiting us. This was really wonderful and uh, sharing your really great research with us. And I have another round of applause for you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me uh, and for the questions and everything. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you've seen this was really an excellent presentation, many inspiring ideas in here. So if you're interested in asking further questions, we're both on social media, so you can contact us. You can ask questions in the comment section. I would forward them and see to get them answered. And of course, there's also additional references to the papers in case you want to have a closer look to the mathematical details. I found this really an inspiring presentation and in particular the exciting things about the open source Melba journal but also the open source toolboxes like Voxenmorph is really something that pushes our community ahead and it's great to hear presentations like this one. So I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I did and I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>